Lee was known for domestic violence. Only two brave women survived him, his wife and one stalking victim named Diane Alexander, who he relentlessly beat, kicked, and strangled with a telephone cord, even tried to rape her. He whispered to her, I've been watching you. He enjoyed terrorizing his victims, having that power. Lee was in the process of murdering her when, by the grace of God, her son came home. This is the reality of who Derek Todd Lee is. Her story is included. Stay with me. You'll hear how he killed each of his victims. You'll learn his pattern of behavior, why most likely he chose to kill these women, how he tricked them. Together, we can learn crime to fight crime. Let's get into it. In order to understand how these violent murders came to be, we need to start at the beginning, follow the timeline to see how it unraveled, or should I say, how Lee unraveled. Derek Todd Lee was born November 5th, 1968, in St. Francisville, Louisiana. He was the second of four children, three brothers and one sister. He was very close to her, had lots of family and friends that he grew up with. His father, Samuel Ruth, ended up in a mental institution soon after Derek was born after trying to kill his second wife in 1991, attempted manslaughter. His mother, Florence Lee, worked as a laborer at a sweet potato factory. She married a man named Coleman Barrow. His stepfather was a hands-on disciplinarian and diligent with Bible studies. Some say his mother was a controlling and oppressive woman who only watched Coleman abuse her children. And some say she was a normal mom. Who's to know what truly goes on behind closed doors? But Derek himself said during trial of the physical abuse he suffered at the hands of his stepfather when he attempted to intervene to prevent his stepsister from being molested. What I do know is Lee considered himself a ladies' man. In his mind, all his victims had wanted him, and he said they were too ashamed to tell anyone of their affair. He was their secret. He made sure he took to their graves. Lee did come across like two separate personalities, as even functional narcissists are known to do. One, a Bible-preaching man that provided for his family, and the other, a vicious killer that hung out at bars hitting on women. It's like neither knew about the other, or more like an inherent denial, just gaslighting everyone. Was this hereditary from his father? Regardless, he was a deadly parasite on society. The American Journal of Psychiatry said non-nurturing parent-child relationships may lead to acting out of intense hostility and homicidal behavior. Lower intelligence and mental retardation have also been reported to play a role in homicide. So here we have Lee, who was put in special education classes due to his IQ being 60, 75, and he was bullied by classmates who called him retarded. He was also outshined by his young sister academically, ended up a high school dropout who got his GED. He may have academically failed, but his street sense did not. He started out birdwatching as a child, and by the time he turned 11, he had been caught peeping into the windows of girls in his neighborhood, which he continued to do as an adult. Animals didn't escape Lee's sick torture. He enjoyed hanging cats setting them on fire, and watching them scream and burn, something he enjoyed, as all serial killers have a history of doing. November 8, 1981, three days after he turned 13, he was arrested for burglarizing and vandalizing a candy store, pled guilty to burglary, and ordered restitution. Just got probation. By 1984, when he was 16, his violent temper went on record. He was charged with attempted second-degree murder of Roy Rayford using a knife. No disposition in that case. 
by February of 1985, when he was 17. Reports have been made by two girls to police. He was peeping in their homes for weeks. Nothing became of it. Lee was never required to spend any time in juvenile detention for any of his offenses. October 1985, Melissa Montz was an LSU doctoral graduate who had disappeared while jogging in between 6 a.m. and 7 a.m., which was a pattern she kept. Would it have been easy for Lee to stalk her? Her body was found decomposed on a golf course in 1995. She had been tied to a log with her legs spread and raped. They think she had been strangled to death. No arrests were ever made. Was this Lee's first murder? August 17, 1988, Lee married a local mail courier, Jacqueline Denise Sims, in Solitude, Louisiana. Lee got a job as a pipe fitter and later completed training to operate a diesel dump truck and lay concrete. He and his wife lived in Baton Rouge, had two children, and settled into a brick ranch house just south of town. It was said they took family trips often, weekend outings, a regular family man. On the other side, he cruised the local bars, dressed in fine attire, and spent time drinking and having extra marital affairs with women. Those who knew him described him as well-dressed and an incessant flirter who was gregarious and friendly. He wore cowboy boots and drove flashy pickup trucks. He's regularly described by those who met him as charming. Oh, trust me, he was an expert at being charming. In this timeline, I'm going to include dates and descriptions of Lee's life events that happened because, as they know, life events can have an effect on intervals between murders and may even act as a catalyst to kill again. Todd had his type of woman he wanted, the ones he knew he could never have. He felt he had every right to them. Who do they think they were? The thought enraged him. Pretty, high society, smooth, pale skin, and high cheekbones. Lee went on his prowl. August 22, 1992. Lee's insurance on his 1979 Buick was canceled. The next couple of days, August 23rd, 24th, 1992, 41-year-old Connie Warner was reported missing. She was an accountant, divorced, and lived for her 17-year-old teenage daughter. Clearly, an altercation had happened in her bedroom. A pair of white and pink panties stained with blood. The floors in several of her rooms had blood splatters. Her keys were missing, and her washer and dryer appeared to have been moved, possibly indicating that she had attempted to vainly hold on to them while Lee literally dragged her away. Another key piece of evidence was her car. A chunk of Connie's brown hair was on the hood. He liked to rip chunks of hair from his victims by the root. The incident was apparently so horrifying for her, she had vomited in the car from the whole altercation, which told them she was still alive when she was placed in her car. The whole drive, she knew she was going to die. Then he drove her car back to her home. A witness said he saw a man carrying a bundle to her car that night and a bundle to a red Buick Electric. Andre Burgos was the former boyfriend of Connie's teenage daughter and uh, he was considered a suspect because Connie didn't approve of him. They were at odds, so police never took him serious after he said he saw a man who looked like Lee watching the family's house prior to Connie's death. Luckily, her daughter had stayed with her boyfriend. That little girl's life forever changed at only 17 years old. A few days later, Hurricane Andrew happened August 26th hindering their search. September 2nd, 1992, nine days later, a truck driver discovered Warner's body laying in a ditch near the state capitol building. She was badly decomposed and nude. The object they feel she was beaten with was a hammer. She had been beaten so bad she had a skull fracture. November 1992, Lee was arrested for illegal entry and burglary 
of Zachary, Louisiana resident Rob Bing's house. Bike riding was how Lee liked to get around sometimes. Biking through the Fenwood Hills neighborhood of Zachary, he found a house that looked empty. Parking in the front yard of Rob's house, barged into the house without knocking. Behind him, the kitchen door was left wide open. Lee had no sense of respect for others. Bing returned home from the grocery store and was surprised when Lee came out of his bedroom with a friendly handshake. Said he was looking for a party. However, it was Lee who was surprised when Bing picked up the phone and called police. Lee fled into a place he would come to know quite well, the Azalea Rest Cemetery. He tried hiding behind some gravestones where his massive form was not easily concealed. It was of no surprise when the police found him a short time later, captured him, and he was taken into custody. He made bail in only two days. January 1993, Lee and his accomplice, Thomas Whitaker Jr., were arrested for breaking into the home of 73-year-old Melvin Foster, whom they beat with a stick and robbed. Once again, bailed out. April 4th, 1993, Michelle Chapman was 15 at the time, and her date, Ricky Johnson, were parked in the cemetery just behind Connie Warner's neighborhood, next to the Azalea Rest Cemetery, in his 1992 Burgundy Toyota Corolla. Little did they know, Lee was watching them. Regardless it was raining, he just opened the passenger side car door, pushed his way in, and started hacking at them with a long, sharp bush blade. This 6'1", 220-pound, well-dressed man in a red button-up shirt. Ricky jumped in front of Michelle to protect her. Michelle leaped in the front seat, trying to start the car, the blade striking down on the boy's head, arms, and hands. Officer Bob Eugangs was across the way. He saw a dome light come on in the parked car in the cemetery, what looked like a struggle, and decided to check it out. Lee ripped away from Ricky in the back seat and came at Michelle, who was trying to start the car. She said she looked at her attacker right in the eye. The one thing I remember were his eyes because they were big and bloodshot and full of rage. Her right foot was almost completely amputated by Lee as he lunged to get her slashing the blade. Officer Eubanks lights lit up the Toyota and saw the bloodied faces inside. Lee struggled to get the keys from Michelle, got them from her, then ran off. On the ground nearby, the cop found a bloody sword cane, sharp enough to cut through flesh like butter. Oh, Lee made sure of that. It would be six years before either of them could identify Lee. Luck was once again on Lee's side. July 1993, Lee is sentenced to one year in prison for the burglary of Rob Bing's house. September 1995, Lee was arrested for voyeurism and resisting arrest after fleeing police. During the same month, Lee was arrested again for stealing from a Salvation Army thrift store. He was just going to pack up what he wanted and walk out. As I said, Lee had zero respect for others. In 1996, he was arrested for a DWI. As if good luck wasn't already happening with this killer. Additionally, in 1996, Jacqueline's father was killed in a plant explosion and she was awarded a quarter of a million dollars. Lee had no problem blowing through her money. With a financial boost, Lee was now able to dress better, buy cars, and spend more money on his girlfriend, Cassandra Green. Even had a son with her behind his family's backs. And no, this should not be an acceptable behavior for women to endure. In February 1997, a Zachary officer saw Lee walking near the Oak Shadows subdivision. The officer asked him what he was doing, and Lee said he was looking for someone. He told the officer his vehicle had broken down. The officer told Lee he would give him a ride back to his vehicle. He found Lee's vehicle parked near a bar across from the cemeteries, was clearly on any hunt he could come across. June 13, 1997, 34-year-old Eugenie Bothfontaine 
I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly. Please forgive me. She was a graduate student. She was abducted from either her home on Stanford Avenue in Baton Rouge or from the LSU Lakes, where she sometimes liked to take walks. A visiting professor found her credit cards aligned in a circle near the lakes on June 14th. Police found her keys in the same area three days later. Zachary Police Department Lieutenant David McDavid testified at Lee's hearing that on July 31st, 1997, he investigated two Peeping Tom complaints in the Shadow Oak Shadow subdivision in Zachary. Lee was arrested in the area for these incidents, and Lieutenant McDavid later learned that Lee had been seen in the same area in February of that year. Lee was subsequently convicted of the Peeping Tom offenses. August 7, 1997, 34-year-old Eugenie Bosfontaine, her body was discovered near the Alligator Bayou Bar. She had died from a skull fracture resulting from a beating. Although she had never been officially linked, many investigators feel that the location of her home indicates that she was Derek Todd Lee's first victim from Stanford. August 1997, Lee's arrested after being caught looking into the windows of a woman. April 16, 1998, Lee gets fired from Louisiana Ready Mix Cement. April 18, 1998, Lee and his girlfriend, Cassandra Green, have a major fight. I'm assuming he had already blew through all of their money by this time, and they were broke. This fight was just hours before his next victim's disappearance. According to the FBI, anger is a motivation in which an offender displays rage or hostility towards a certain subgroup of the population or with society as a whole. Power thrill is a motivation in which the offender feels empowered and or excited when he kills his victims. Sexually based is a motivation driven by the sexual needs desires of the offender. April 19th, 1998. 28-year-old Randy Jane Mubrier was a home health nurse and manager of a home health program by occupation. She went to the local video store near her home in Zachary. On April 18th, she and her young son returned to their residence on Saul Avenue at approximately 7 p.m. She has never been seen again. Her young son walked to a neighbor's home the following morning and said that his mother was missing. The adults entered the residence and discovered blood on the floors, saw signs of a violent struggle. They then called the authorities to the home. Police say the evidence shows someone killed or seriously injured her the night before. On the floor in the hallway, detectives found her contact lenses. She was literally hit so hard on the back of the head, it popped both her contact lenses out where they laid. There was a pink plastic bag under her carport, which was stained with her blood. On the outside of the plastic roll, standing out against the pink background, was a spot of blood and a spot of what would later be identified as semen. There was a large amount of blood left in her home. Evidence indicated that she was attacked, severely beaten, and abducted from her residence, and that the incident occurred during a four-hour period between 10.30 p.m. and 2.30 a.m., tortured for four hours by Lee. The Zachary police knew Lee had been arrested as a peeping Tom in the same subdivision and in the St. Francisville area. Muber's house was located in the Zachary subdivision of Oak Shadows. The house sat around the block from where Connie Warner used to live. This is the same time McDavid showed Michelle Chapman a photo lineup that included Lee. She picked him right out, but it was too late by this time. The statute of limitations had run out on attempted murder, so McDavid couldn't arrest him. This cemetery where Michelle was attacked bordered the Oak Shadows subdivision. July of 1999, Derek's girlfriend, Cassandra, had given birth to their son, who they named Diedrich Lee. August 19, 1999, St. Francisville Police Department Officer Archie Lee took statements from three women who lived in the St. Francisville Square Apartments. Each of these women stated that Lee had been stalking them in the apartment complex, and each identified Lee's picture in a photographic lineup. Oh, Lee 
was so smug in what he did, he caught the attention of investigators after he discussed the murder of Mubrauer with an assortment of individuals, probably in a bar. It's like a joke to him. When his DOC records were pulled, it was discovered Lee's criminal history included arrests for stalking, burglary, attempted murder, peeping Tom behavior, an assortment of other crimes. August 19, 1999, Colette Walker Dwyer. Lee had entered her apartment on two occasions without her consent. He bumped into her at her apartment complex, naming a couple of people who lived there, but those very people said they did not know him. Other times, she saw him in the bushes looking at her. It was said that he was even a customer at her job, constantly trying to know her. Came across very charming and non-threatening. He finally got bold one day, forced his way into her apartment, saying he wanted to take care of her, take her on a trip to Lafayette, which she respectfully declined. On another occasion, he forced his way in, flipping off the light. She flipped it back on, and he told her that he could rape her if he wanted to. He only left when she walked out of her apartment, and he followed her. Her gut told her he was the Baton Rouge killer. She reported him to police, but he did not match the race for them to consider him. According to courthouse records, Colette Walker Dwyer pressed charges in August 1999, and St. Francisville police arrested Lee on charges of stalking and peeping. Once again, luck was on Lee's side. He was sentenced to probation in December 1999. Shockingly, they never took his DNA as the law states. Not to mention the labs were severely understaffed and backlogged back then. So even if they did submit Lee's DNA, no telling how long it would have taken to get it back. January 2000. Lee is accused of attempted first-degree murder after severely kicking and stomping his girlfriend, Cassandra Green, at a bar after an argument over Lee's advances towards another woman. While trying to flee from the police following the incident, he allegedly tried to run over the sheriff's deputy with his car. Lee was sentenced to two years for that incident. Well, Cassandra pressed charges for Lee's violence on her, and his probation was revoked. He spent the following year in prison until his release in February 2001. He was placed on house arrest and was required to wear monitoring equipment. In May 2001, he was found guilty of violating the terms of his parole by removing the equipment. And instead of having his probation revoked, who, Lee? Oh, heck no. He was given a legal slap on the hand and not returned to prison. Once again, the opportunity to remove Derek Todd Lee from society was lost, a decision that likely haunts those who made it. Oh, it gets more horrifying for Colette Walker Dwyer. She was not notified of his sentence or his release until he showed up at her apartment again and continued stalking her. So you can imagine how petrified she was. It's important to understand his motivation behind these stalking behaviors and the risk that they present is profoundly important to protect the public. According to the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, they said that although stalking is a crime in all 50 states, less than one third of the states classify stalking as a felony if it's a first offense. This leaves stalking victims without protections afforded to victims of other violent crimes as a domino effect. This wasn't the only problem at the time. Considering the fact most serial killers are said to be white, this is exactly how they overlooked Lee. Back in 1990, the FBI estimates that there are between 25 and 50 serial killers operating throughout the U.S. at any given time. Contrary to proper popular mythology, not all serial killers are white. Serial killers span all racial and ethnic groups in the U.S. significantly. September 22, 2001. 
Lee arrested for battery against his wife, but charges are later dismissed. And no, they did not take his DNA as required because the funding wasn't available. Used to cost over 2000 per offender. Now they say they have grant programs and it's only a few hundred. September 24th, 2001. 41-year-old Gina Wilson Green was a registered nurse. Spunky and outgoing. She had a home on Stanford Avenue of Louisiana State University. At 3.45 a.m., her security system went off. This is when Lee realized she had an alarm system. He had been stalking her for a month, they think. Police were baffled. There were no broken windows or doors, no jimmy locks. Gina's alarm was not activated at the time she was attacked, meaning she answered her door. We have a habit of doing this, don't we? to a person who seems harmless or says they are with the water or electric company or says they're an inspector. Um, Lee commonly used methods like this. Well, if you're alone in your house, please don't answer the door to anyone you don't know. She and her ex-husband had no children and had grown apart after 19 years of marriage, but remained friends. Mark says Gina was always extremely careful, had pepper spray in nearly all her windows. Her one mistake was answering her door. They found a gob of her hair ripped from her head. Does that sound familiar? That was in the hallway. He had ripped her clothes off her little body in the kitchen. She had no chance against 200 pounds, six foot tall Lee. She was brutally raped and sodomized in the bathroom. Then, after he was finished humiliating and degrading her, he strangled her to death on the floor. Lee then placed her on the bed and covered her with a sheet. Her life meant nothing to him, only his six sexual fantasies. In April 2002, Angela Ross, an expert in DNA analysis with the crime lab, obtained a complete DNA profile from a spot of blood recovered from the back elbow of Green's blouse. Ross described that spot of blood to matching anyone else's as one in 3.6 quadrillion. So yeah, it was Lee. Police said Green's cell phone and purse were missing. Lee was known to take items like this. The cell phone was found weeks later in an alley on Choctaw Street, along with her checkbook, credit cards, and a towel from her house, just blocks from where Connie Warner's body had been found nine years earlier. Just two days before Gina was murdered, remember I mentioned Lee's wife, Jackie, filed domestic violence complaint against Lee? He spent the month of October locked up. They tried to keep him on parole violation, but ended up only reprimanding him and releasing him. Gina Wilson Green lived two houses down from Eugenie's home, who he killed in 1997. January 11, 2002, Lee is fired from his job at J.E. Merritt, probably spent all his time stalking women. Three days later, yeah, you got it. January 14, 2002, 21-year-old Geraldine Barr DeSoto lived in Addis, Louisiana. Her family referred to her as Sissy, how she was very athletic and easygoing. She was an LSU grad student. So much life to live for. She was getting ready for a job interview she had at 2.30 p.m. when Lee knocked on her door. He tried to make himself familiar roaming the neighborhood as if he lived there. I can see him waving to her at different times like a harmless little puppy. Geraldine never arrived at the interview she had at 2.30 p.m. They think he knocked on her door and asked to use her phone because once Lee got the phone, he bashed her right between the eyes with it with such force. If she had survived, she would have had brain damage. He stabbed her three times. She ran for her bedroom and got their shotgun. She turned it on Lee, but the gun wasn't loaded. Lee jerked it from her hands and beat her with the butt of the gun. She didn't go down without a fight though. She clawed Lee, leaving his DNA evidence under her fingernails. They had to pry the evidence out of her clenched hand, which linked him to her murder. 
Lee cut her throat from ear to ear using such force he nearly decapitated her. Then he thought he'd play doctor and tried to put her throat back together. How do they know that? They got his DNA off her throat. West Baton Rouge coroner's office chose to go against standard procedure and did not run a rape kit on her. But we all know this was Lee's MO. Lee violently stomped her body numerous times before he left. Like how dare she try to shoot him. That's old entitled Lee, all right. Takes what he wants and how he wants it. The trail of bloody footprints matched the sole pair of boots Lee owned. Her husband, Darren, left his job around 6.15 p.m. He was concerned because he had called his wife several times during the day with no answer. He arrived home around 7 p.m. and found the door slightly open. At first, he didn't believe his wife was home. But when he looked down the hall, he saw her lying on her side in a pool of blood. Darren ran and touched her and found she was cold. He also thought, saw that her throat had been cut. He ran to the home of a neighbor who called the police. She was pronounced dead at the scene. At first, they suspected her husband, Darren. He failed a voice analysis test. Her diary sadly showed he was very mentally abusive to her, but DNA exonerated him. He also used a credit card at a location too far to have committed the crime. Her murder was not linked to the other silly killings until June 19th, 2003. May 18th, 2002, Harmony Corporation let Lee go. He then received his first unemployment check from them, and five days later, yep. May 23rd, 2002, 23-year-old Christine Moore disappeared while jogging along River Road in Baton Rouge. Her home was not far from the home of one of Lee's other victims. He is only a suspect in her case. May 30th, 2002, a woman named Rebecca, a mass communication senior, placed an emergency call from her Charlotte apartment. She saw a man, who she now identifies as Lee, wearing only tube socks and masturbating in his vehicle near her apartment. Baton Rouge Police Department authorities said they have no record of the call or any dispatch. Lee's good luck prevails once again. One day later, yep. May 31st, 2002, 21-year-old Charlotte Murray Pace finished high school when she was only 16, finished her B.A. at 20, and just finished her M.B.A. from LSU as one of the youngest students to receive an M.B.A. Her family and friends called her Murray. After graduating from LSU, she continued her graduate work with the LSU Alumni Association until her job in Atlanta at the firm of Deloitte and Douche would have begun later that summer. Extremely difficult to get a job there, I might add. She had moved from her Stanford Avenue apartment after the horrendous murder of Green, fearing she may be next. She moved down to Charlotte Avenue in Baton Rouge that she shared with Rebecca Yeager, a close friend for six years. After leaving her graduate work that day, Murray washed her newly acquired 99 BMW at approximately 11.52 a.m. The police got the car wash receipts, and then she went to her townhouse. Murray and Rebecca planned to travel to Alexandria, Louisiana, to attend the weekend wedding of a former roommate of theirs. She had her ironing board out, and she was getting ready to iron some of her clothes before her trip, sat down on the couch to eat her sandwich, when she got a knock on her door. Little did she know Lee had been studying her for months. As with the other women, he managed to know what to say to get her to open the door. Rebecca was expected at 1 p.m., but was running late and showed up at 2 p.m., when she came in, she saw blood all over the hall, living room, furniture, floors, and walls. A trail leading to the bedroom where she found Murray lying nude on the floor between the bedroom door and the bed. She had been violently raped and sodomized. There were a number of defensive wounds on her arms, forearms, hands, and wrists inflicted as she attempted to ward off 220-pound Lee. She ran to check on Murray. 
but saw her throat was completely cut open. She saw holes in her chest. She then ran to get a phone to call police, but it was missing, so she used her cell phone. Murray had not only been violently raped and sodomized, but then she was stabbed more than 81 times with a screwdriver and a knife. Oh, Lee always wanted his victims alive to experience the brutal violation he did to them. And after he's finished, time to finish them off, just like all the rest. She received blunt force head injuries crushing her skull and blunt trauma to the eyeballs. Such injuries would have been consistent with blows inflicted with the iron. Dr. Kramer autopsy report opted that the cause of her death was exsanguation, meaning she bled to death. Julia Nair was the forensic analyst with the Louisiana State Police Crime Lab. She obtained her most complete DNA profile from the sample taken from the victim's left buttock. Naylor calculated the probability of a random match to the genetic profile of Murray's assailant was 1 in 3.6 quadrillion persons. It was definitely Lee. At the time of Green's murder, Pace was living three doors down from Green. She lived three houses down from where Eugenie was murdered in 97. June 16, 2002. 23-year-old Christine Moore's body was found in a ravine that ran alongside the Ebenezer Baptist Church just a few miles further down River Road. Dogs were actually scavenging her remains. She died from a skull fracture resulting from blunt force trauma. She was nude, severely bludgeoned. She was brutally raped. Christine was working on her master's degree at LSU. July 8, 2002, Angela Ross and Julia Nair, the two DNA analysts with the crime lab who had independently obtained DNA profiles in the Green and Pace murders, compared the DNA results in their respective cases. Immediately, it became apparent to them that the results from the DNA samples they independently examined in their respective cases, indicated that a single perpetrator committed those homicides. July 9, 2002, the task force announces to the public the same person killed Gina Wilson Green and Charlotte Murley Pace. No doubt in my mind, Lee was watching this unfold on TV, as serial killers are known to do. This same day? Yep. July 9, 2002, Diane Alexander. She was a nurse. She was attacked at her home west of Baton Rouge in rural St. Martin Parish. That morning, Diane was getting ready for work when a man who identified himself as Anthony knocked on her front door asking for directions to the Montgomery's. When she said she didn't know the Montgomery's, Lee asked to use her telephone. He then asked her if her husband might know where the Montgomery's are. When she said her husband wasn't home, yeah, I know. Don't ever tell a stranger at your door your husband isn't home. Well, Lee made her feel comfortable and as if he was harmless, which he was an expert at. But the moment she said her husband wasn't home, his demeanor quickly changed. He forced his way into her home and overpowered her. Lee caught her by the throat told her not to try anything because he was armed with a knife and that he would poke her in the eye. He then attempted to rape her, but he couldn't maintain an erection. In anger, he bludgeoned her and attempted to strangle her with the telephone cord he cut from the home computer that was close at hand. Diane placed her hand between the telephone cord and her neck in an effort to stop her strangulation. She was passing in and out of consciousness when her son, Herman arrived at the residence. He chased Lee through the back of the house, seeing the car Lee fled in. He described it as a gold Mitsubishi Eclipse with the Hampton Hazard plate on the front and further noted it had a dent on the hood. He also observed a beige telephone cord hanging out of the car window. Herman found his mother on the floor lying in a pool of blood. Alexander had a skull fracture and she was rushed via helicopter to the Lafayette Hospital, where she remained in a coma for five days. 
Diane Alexander is the only known survivor of Derek Todd Lee. Then three days later, you guessed it, Lee strikes again. July 12th, 2002, 44-year-old Pamela Cecilia Piglia Kinnamore. She was the owner of Comforts and Joy's Antique Shop in Denham Springs. She disappeared from her Briar Estates place in Baton Rouge. She was reported missing by her husband on Friday after he returned home from work late to find her vehicle parked in the drive, a tub full of bath water drawn and no sign of Pam. There were clear signs of a struggle, blood scattered throughout their home, no sign of a forced entry. However, her keys were found still in the door with their purse and wallet on the table which Pam was known to do, feeling she lived in a safe neighborhood. Authorities immediately launched a full-scale search for Pam, which included a ground and helicopter search near the couple's Briarwood Estates home. A potential eyewitness that was a truck driver claimed he saw a white pickup truck with a white man driving with a naked woman slumped over in the passenger seat. Unfortunately, there were 35,000 white pickup trucks registered in the Baton Rouge area. As the search entered day four, authorities were doubtful that Pam would be found alive. July 15, 2002, Diane Alexander gave a detailed description of her attacker to Detective Arthur Boyd of the St. Martin Parish Sheriff's Office. Through her description, a composite sketch of the attacker was made. The evidence from this crime scene in the sketch, which bore a striking resemblance to Lee, would later become vital in resolving who the perpetrator was in the unsolved homicides of the women in Baton Rouge and Lafayette areas. Despite the existence of this sketch, at this time, the investigation leads were focused on an unknown white male driving a white pickup truck. July 16, 2002, DOTD workers would later find Pamela Kenamore's naked body under the Whiskey Bay Bridge of Interstate 10. Her throat was slit. She had been viciously raped and sodomized, as you know by now how Lee operates. They did a fracture match comparison of the telephone cord and it was, indeed, the same telephone cord from which Diane Alexander's house, which they found a few hundred feet away from Kinnemore's body. An autopsy revealed that Kinnemore had been strangled and three significant cut wounds, five to four inches long, were evident in her neck. These neck wounds cut through the skin, windpipe, below the larynx, and the opening of the airway and opened up both of her jugular veins. Who knows how long we stay conscious after such an atrocity, even if it's only seconds. For those seconds, she suffered an unfathomable reality inflicted by Derek Todd Lee. July 29, 2002. Authorities announce a breakthrough. DNA test by the Louisiana State Police Crime Lab link Kinnemore's killing to the slayings of Green and Pace. July 31, 2002, Baton Rouge Police Department hosted a meeting with local law enforcement investigators. The purpose of the meeting was to find out how many cases were connected to the Baton Rouge serial killer. November 19, 2002, Lee and his wife Jackie filed for bankruptcy. 72 hours later, you got it. November 21, 2002, 23-year-old Trenisha Dene. Column of Lafayette. She liked to be called Danae. She had served in the United States Army and had plans to join the Marines that year. Danae had just finished visiting her mother's grave at Grand Cotu, St. Landry's Parish, Louisiana. She had only died seven months earlier, probably there for her mom's birthday also, which had been on the 13th. As she sat alone in her car for a moment to reflect on the visit is when Lee pounced on her. They think he followed her there. They stated Lee raped, sodomized, and then beat her to death, even bashed her head into a tree in a nearby field, and then drug her body to another field 
30 miles from where her car was located. Authorities say she died of blunt trauma to the head. Investigators also said her car, purse, and keys were found in the Grand Cateau near the cemetery. Once again, a witness reported a white male in a white pickup truck near the cemetery, just like in Pam Kilmore's case. For all we know, it was Lee making those calls. November 24, 2002, a rabbit hunter found Trenisha her body in a muddy field in Scott, Louisiana, along with a muddy footprint near her body they later matched to Lee's shoes, Adidas high top size 9. Initially, investigators ruled out the possibility that Cullum's murder was related to the serial killers due to the fact that she was African American and the other confirmed victims were all white. However, every other aspect of her life fit the profile of the serial killer's victims. The semen at the scene positively linked Lee to Trenisha, the murder of Gina Wilson Green, Charlotte Murley Pace, and Pam Kinnamore. At this time, though, they only had matching DNA to an unknown predator. A Miss Booker conducted analysis of the DNA from a vaginal swab of Miss Cullum. She testified that the probability of selecting a random individual with the same profile would be one in 30 trillion. So, yeah, it was Lee. November 24th, 2002, women began to frantically take self-defense classes and sales for guns, pepper spray, and alarm systems skyrocketed. December 17th, two of Lee's vehicle plates are canceled because of unpaid insurance bills. December 24th, 2002, 65-year-old Mary Ann Fowler, a former career education advocate and a former state secretary of education, was last seen standing outside a Subway sandwich shop in a strip mall on Louisiana Highway 415 west of Port Allen at 5.30 p.m., on Christmas Eve. Investigators believe she was abducted from that location. Mari's belongings were found scattered on the pavement shortly after she disappeared, along with some of her acrylic fingernails, which were possibly torn off in her struggle with her abductor. Robbery was probably not the motive for her kidnapping, as her food, purse, and keys were left behind, and wrapped Christmas presents were found in the back seat of her car. For years, investigators had Lee as their prime suspect in Fowler's disappearance, but they never felt they had enough evidence to bring a case to prosecution. For one, the fact that Gross Teat and St. Gabriel cell towers hid on Lee's cell phone in the general location of Fowler's disappearance the night she was abducted. For two, the pickup truck Lee once owned that seemed possibly to match the one visible in the surveillance video. For three, the fact that Lee sold a maroon Chevrolet pickup just days after the sheriff's, sheriff's investigators disclosed to the media that they were looking for that kind of pickup in the Fowler case. December 31, 2002, police release a sketch of the killer during a news conference. February 17, 2003, Lee's bankruptcy request is questioned and a hearing gets scheduled. On March 1st, Bell South hires a collection agency for Lee's unpaid $496 phone bill. March 3rd, 2003, Carrie Lynn Yoder was a doctoral student at LSU in Baton Rouge when she disappeared from her home near campus. They found she had been unloading groceries from her car. Her boyfriend of three years, Lee Stanton, reported her missing two days after she failed to call him. The last time Lee spoke with Carrie, she was headed to the Winn-Dixie. After not hearing from her or having his calls answered, Lee went to Carrie's apartment where he found the lights on, her car where it was supposed to be, and the back door open, all just as it would normally be for a young woman bringing in bags from the supermarket. March 13, 2003. Carrie Lynn Yoder was found. Lee had bludgeoned and severely beat her. He hit her so hard, her liver was lacerated, and her ribs were all broken in pieces. He then raped her, finishing her off by strangling her to death. 
Her battered body was discovered near the Whiskey Bay Bridge, less than 10 yards from where Pam Kinnemore's body was found eight months previous. DNA made her Derek Todd Lee's fifth victim. Her murder also incited panic on the campus among female students. LSU honored her by awarding her parents the Ph.D. she would have received. Natasha Poe, the DNA analyst who examined the evidence obtained from Yoder's sexual assault kit, opined the probability of a random match to the genetic profile of Yoder's assailant was one in 3.6 quadrillion persons. So yeah, it was Lee. April 1st, 2003. Zachary Copps began to receive complaints from a woman in Oak Shadow subdivision. Someone was stalking her on her early morning jogs. April 2003, the Lafayette Chamber of Commerce, the Lafayette Crime Stoppers, and Baton Rouge Crime Stoppers offered the public a reward of $50,000 for information relating to the murders of five South Louisiana women and a $100,000 reward for information on the South Louisiana serial killer and leading to the arrest and indictment of the South Louisiana serial killer. Police contact the FBI in Washington, D.C. and ask for an investigative analysis. They predicted the perpetrator was antisocial and earned a below-average income. They obtained DNA samples from over a 1,000 white men between the ages of 20 and 40 with a criminal history. Not one of them was a match. March 2003. Tony Frudakis, head of a small genomic testing company in Florida. Frudakis said he could provide a physical description of the killer based on a novel genomic test, which revealed the killer's heritage. The test revealed that the killer's heritage was approximately 85% African and the rest Native American. That's what changed the entire focus from a white suspect to one of mixed racial heritage with a moderately dark skin tone. May 22, 2003 is when they obtained that composite sketch from Mrs. Alexander. The task force released to the public through television and print media the composite as a depiction of the South Louisiana serial killer, as well as Herman's description of the attacker's fleeing vehicle, on May 23, 2003, within hours, callers contacted officials stating, I'm looking at Derek Todd Lee. The car is in his mother's front yard. After the sketch was released and DNA linked Lee to the killings, the task force presented Miss Alexander with a photographic lineup, and on May 25, 2003, she identified Lee as her attacker. May 26, 2003, Lee's name was released to the public as a South Louisiana serial killer. An arrest warrant was issued for Derek Todd Lee for first-degree murder of Carrie Lynn Yoder. May 27, 2003, Lee spent at least the past week in a dingy Atlanta motel where he charmed residents, grilled ribs, and chicken at a party and set up a Bible study group. Neighbors described Lee as a handsome, smooth-talking man who dated several women and promised them cognac if they would come to his room. May 27, 2003, the Atlanta Police Department Fugitive Squad arrested Derek Todd Lee. Oh my God, it's about time. August 10th, 2004, a West Baton Rouge Parish jury began deliberating Lee's fate at 3.35 p.m. One hour and 40 minutes later, the jury came back with an 11 to 1 guilty verdict, convicted Lee of second-degree murder of Geraldine DeSoto. October 13th, 2004, another jury found Lee guilty of killing Charlotte Murray Pace. Lee was sentenced to death for his brutality. January 16th, 2016, Lee was rushed to the hospital from his confinement due to an unknown medical issue. January 21st, 2016, Lee died shortly before 9 a.m. while receiving medical care at a Baton Rouge hospital. He was 47 years old. Coroner stated it was heart disease. Lee wasn't connected to Murbauer until after his conviction.
Thank you all so much for watching. I appreciate it very much. Please like and subscribe for more.